There we go. Hi guys, it's Jeff here, the Photographer's Mentor, joined again for the second webinar with Kelty Maguire, the Clarity Coach. And today is a really interesting topic because I know this is something a lot of photographers really do struggle with. And um, when when I have photographers come on board my program or phone me up or, or jump on a call, one of the big things they talk about is is the you know the, the amount of fears they have within the business, and that is fears as in uh, you know procrastination, um, not getting things done. Obviously, a lot of self doubt as well. Self doubt is a big thing for, for mm -hmm. photographers. You know, not believing in themselves. Um, they say that's you know the imposter syndrome. And another thing Kelsey's going to talk about today is perfectionism. And I know as photographers, we are really really up on this perfectionism and I always remember talking to a guy on a, a call once and and he was he was going on about how perfectionism was ruining his business because it was stopping him from moving on it was over editing pictures spending too long and told me this story he once edited this picture for nearly nearly two hours messing around editing this like amazing landscape and then thought the original one was actually better you know so <laughs> it's something we've really really got to get a grip on as photographers uh, overcome our procrastination, overcome our perfectionism, believe in ourselves, stop having that self-doubt. Because remember that our clients don't look at our photographs the way that we do. And sometimes we're over editing or over analyzing ourselves because of the artists within us. And we need to just get it out there, you know, stop putting things off, get it, get it done. Because if we don't, we're never going to move forward. So Again, enough of me waffling on because I'm going to hand you over to Kelty, who uh, has got a great presentation that she's put together, and she's the she's the expert on this. So I'm going to let uh, uh, Kelty go on from from now. Thank you so much, Jeff. And you've already made a lot of good points. And I think just having um, you know sort of discussion with you about today's session and what you've mentioned just now, we could talk about each and every one of these topics: procrastination, self doubt, perfectionism you know, until we're blue in the face. I think there's a lot that we could say about it and perhaps we'll have to do some uh, future dedicated webinars on each and every one of these topics. But today we're gonna to be talking about fear and how fear often masquerades or shows up in our businesses and our lives as those things you mentioned, as self-doubt, as perfectionism, et cetera. Um, I'm gonna be giving you some concrete tactics in order to combat those. Um, I, I kind of have this sense, you know, we're going to cover a lot of ground, but in some sense, we're just getting that conversation going because there's a lot more that can be said in all of these areas. So um, as per last time, I'm just going to be doing a screen share here. So just give me a moment while I got my presentation going. All right. And if you guys would just like to say hi in the chat and tell us where you're from and also what, what your biggest fears are within your business. Uh, is it um, yes. procrastination? Is it perfectionism? Uh, is it, do, do you have a lot of self-doubt or imposter syndrome? Yeah. So I'll just add this to the, the deck. Perfect. Yeah. And just let me know um, when we're, if we're looking good, I know sometimes you've got to kind of make sure the screen is showing us and the slides, but if that looks good, I'll get started. Looks good. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. cool. Okay. So um, again, we're going to be talking about how you can overcome the fears that are holding you back in your photography and photography business. So we're going to be talking, first of all, why you need to move through fear as opposed to trying to combat it. Um, I think a lot of us, we think about really how we can go head to head, how we can fight fear, how we can make fear go away. Um, and I'm going to talk about why I believe this is the wrong approach. I see we've got, I've got a bit of feedback, so hopefully that'll stop. Um, sound feedback. Okay, um, we're going to talk about how this, the subtle ways that fear manifests itself. So uh, we've given you some hints, but fear doesn't always show up as fear. Sometimes it sort of wears a different face. We're going to talk about some of the most commonplace fears. And we're going to talk about lastly, and probably most importantly, some tools that you can use for moving through your fears. So I'm curious to know, first of all, and you can leave a comment and weigh in on this, you know, what happens when we try and fight our fears? When you think about being afraid of something, maybe you think about not being successful in your business. Maybe you think about not getting a contract that you want to have, you know, and you're really feeling afraid. It could be something related to your personal life as well. You know, maybe you have fear around your health or you have fear about a new experience that you are about to, to have. What happens when we really try and combat that and we kind of put on the gloves and say, all right, fear, I'm coming for you. I know for me personally, oftentimes that fear really becomes magnified. It's like, I feel it more intensely. The anxieties get worse. I start to kind of ruminate on things, right? And 
we tend to become immobilized. We feel like we really can't take steps forward because we've got all of these different voices in our ears. All right, and what about if we just wait for our fear to disappear? You know, perhaps you've thought to yourself, okay, I will, uh, let's say there's a, you know, a big brand that you wanna work with. I'll pitch that big brand when I don't feel afraid, when I feel ready. You know, I will, I don't know, ask that, you know, really good looking guy or gal on a date when I feel less fearful. Okay, if we wait for fear to disappear, usually we're gonna be waiting a very long time. It doesn't usually work like that. That's right. And uh, we've got some <clears throat> feedback coming back in the, uh, the the chat here. Actually, um, somebody's asked, can can they watch the catch up on this? And you can. This is recorded. So if you just go to my hashtag, which is hashtag creating successful photographers, you can access the full recording uh, at a later date. So it'll always be there under that hashtag. So if you want to come back and rewatch it, that's totally fine. So um, Philip uh, says, you know, for me, it's worries about scale in my business, accountability to production crews, and also the feeling of imposter syndrome. And another Facebook user, because um, the Facebook ID hasn't come up, is fear for me is when the client asks to do something I know I can't do. Uh, usually it's Photoshop stuff <laughs> that I'm pretty scared of. Okay, that sounds scary to me too. I'm not a Photoshop user. I'm not a photographer as well. I like Canva, <laughs> but I'm going to guess that's not going to be the tool for you in your business. Okay, thank you for sharing that, all of you. So fear really loses its power when we act in spite of it. And when we look at fear and the way fear shows up and manifests, bit of a spoiler here, really the antidote to all of that, to procrastination, to perfectionism, to self-doubt, to any fear that we have is going to be action. We're only going to be able to sort of tame our fears and, like I say, move beyond our fears, move through our fears when we decide to take action. And there's a great analogy I want to share with you or something that I read in the book Big Magic by um, Elizabeth Gilbert, which uh, photographers, if you've not read this book, it's a fantastic book about creativity. And she talks about really just learning to accept that fear is part of the deal. Fear is part of the family. But what she says is, you know, fear can get in the car, it can come along for the ride, but fear is going in the back seat. It's certainly not in the driver's seat and it's not going to be, you know, riding passenger as well. Fear is not going to be giving directions. Fear is not going to be telling us where we pull over. Fear can come along, but it should get in the back seat and basically shut up. Okay. So when we start to just accept and recognize like, hey, this is part of the deal. This is normal that I'm feeling this way. It's normal that I have certain insecurities. It's normal that I feel, you know, unsure about the future, but I can still act in spite of that fear. That's when you'll start to find that fear loses its power. And today we'll talk about how we can do that, how we can take action in spite of fear. And I think, you know, um, an example, I think sometimes when you, when you start overcoming your fear as in, you know, um, taking action like you said and <clears throat> moving forward sometimes you do get a bit of a high and i remember doing my first pub public speaking event i was absolutely terrified but once i actually got up there and started speaking and it, i was speaking about something i'm really passionate passionate about um i started to get it i was on a roll i was on a high because mm -hmm. the, the fear only lasted really up until i started to open my mouth and people pricked up and started looking at us and and paying attention and i could see the the feedback in their eyes and their faces that they were enjoying it and all these self-doubts and ideas that they were going to be laughing at me and i was going to be fumbling my words and i was going to be making a mess they all started to go away and that yeah. allowed me to concentrate on what i was actually doing yeah, I like that you say that because the way I sort of look at it is like there is a release that happens when we take action. And it's a little bit like I haven't ever skydived and I'm not going to do it. You can't convince me despite the fact my analogy is going <laughs> to basically be in support of this idea. But from what I understand, you know, and we can re relate any action we take in life, but it's a little bit about like being on the precipice of that, you know, the edge of the plane where you're going to jump out, right? Yeah. There's so much fear. There's this build. There's this like <gasps> this free fall moment. And then as we begin to fall, and again, I'm sure it's still terrifying, mm -hmm. which is why I'm not going to do it. But there is this sort of like calm that arises despite, you know, that huge adrenaline rush when we're in that moment, when we're in motion, when there's nothing we can do to stop ourselves anymore. Right. We've sort of like released this valve, so to speak. Or in this case, yeah. we, you know, we, we can't stop. We jumped out of the plane. We can pull the cord, hopefully. <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, you know, and I, th- yeah. I think you know, and the, the funny thing is actually they say about skydiving, you know, the most the most dangerous part is the drive to the airport, yeah. you know, because because that that's a lot more dangerous than jumping out of an aircraft. And then I have skydived myself, and, and 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 the feeling is absolutely tremendous. You know, once you actually get out there, you don't get this feeling of hurtling to the ground when you're jumping at mm-hmm. fifty fifteen thousand feet because you're so far away. You haven't got that preconception of distance, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and it, and it, it's definitely worth it. I would encourage you to do it definitely. <laughs> we'll talk about this a different time, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> we will see. Um, you know, I think the biggest fear that all of you should have, if there's one fear you're going to have, the fear you need to have is that the visions that you have for yourself, and of course, we talked about our vision last week, but the vision you have, the goals you have, the dreams you have for your life and your business. The fear you should have is that they're not going to happen because you're going to be so paralyzed from taking action, right? That that needs to be the fear that we have. And for me, I think about, you know, the alternative to the life I'm creating. That to me is, I have to say, that's going to be scarier than any of the small fears that are going to accompany me moving towards my goals. So as I said here, you know, I'll act when I'm no longer afraid. If you find yourself saying or thinking those words or something along those lines, you're probably going to have to be, you know, preparing yourself for a long wait. We This expectation that someday we won't be fearful. I think if you would ask any person who is successful, who's pursuing their goals, who are doing the things that you want to do, they would tell you that they're afraid anyways. And it's just part of the deal. I know it is for me. All right. So fear has many faces. Yeah, and, and, and Nick Neal uh, raises a Nick Neal raises a good point. And she says, start with small manageable steps. Mm-hmm. Um, to manage your fears and nerves, and then remember to give yourself recognition and praise for completing each step, um, and use this to increase you, um, you, your confidence as you go along. Yes, good tips, 100%. I would agree with that. So I'm curious to know, how does fear show up in your life? And maybe you can just leave a comment and let us all know, you know, does it show up? Some of you sort of mentioned at the beginning, it shows up with these ideas of not being good enough or being worried you're going to leave clients hanging and unhappy. Um, Maybe fear shows up and it tells you stories. Maybe fear shows up and it, you know, totally immobilizes you. Love to know sort of the face that fear wears in your life or how that shows up in your life, in your business. Now, as we, you know, we sort of already discussed, fear can show up in a few different ways. So first of all, it can show up as procrastination. And really the, the idea behind this is if I put this off, I don't have to face my fears. Like if I don't get this project done, nobody's gonna reject me because it's not out there in the world anyways. So procrastination is not always, but often because we've got some sort of underlying fear. Perfectionism is another one. You know, if I'm perfect, none of my fears will come true. It's this sort of sense that we can have or create a type of immunity if we do everything just right. People pleasing is another one. I I think one of you um, had mentioned that, you know, that while the clients are going to be upset wanting to make sure they're happy, you know, we don't want people to judge us or dislike us. So then we behave in ways that is accommodating people. Self-doubt's another one. I don't have what it takes to be successful. You know, I'm an imposter. I'm going to be found out. I don't have the same credentials as my competitors, whatever. And those are just a few examples. Now, um, there's a woman by the name of Ruth Ruth Sokup, pardon me. um, And she actually does a lot of, she's a coach as well. She does a lot of work around fears. And she's created, after compiling um, a lot of research on this topic, this free archetype fear, um, pardon me, fear archetype quiz that you can do. And she has basically deduced it down to seven different fear archetypes. Um, These are four of them, but there's three others, of course. Um, so I, you know, encourage you, if you're not sure, you might not really know how fear is showing up in your life. It's important that we're able to identify it because otherwise we're going to just say, you know, I'm just a procrastinator. But if we understand what resides underneath that procrastination, that can be that first step of taking the right steps forward to move away from it. And I think, you know, a couple of the, the things to touch on, and I've yeah. mentioned this to people before, is that, you know, like a lot of people talk about perfectionism. But if you look at any big company, organizations, app manufacturers, you know, manufacturer of any product, 
every product, every app, every app is beta tested. Every bit of software is beta tested. Every product is tested regionally. So they might say, right, we're going to test it in, you know, in this particular part of London before we do a UK launch to get feedback. Even when LinkedIn does a, a rollout of a new feature, it's rolled out on a small scale and gets bigger. And the reason being is, is for feedback because if we all waited to get something perfect, it would never, mm -hmm. ever happen. And quite often what we think is perfect, we put it out to our clients and then they're like, yeah, we like it, but wouldn't it be better if we did this or you tried this or you added yeah. that? Um, so, you know, I think definitely, as uh, so Phil says, Adobe uses um, uh, beta testers, you know, so it, it, it is, it, it's, it's, we don't know until we get it out there. And if we don't yeah. get it out there, when we're never, ever going to know. That's going to yeah. just continue to hold us back. Yeah, and I'd agree with two things you said there, which is effectively, you know, we can't be great until we're good and we can't be good until we're okay. And we're, we can't be okay until, you know, maybe we're subpar. Like we're, we're not just gonna wake up one day and be amazing. We have to be out there in the world, trying things, putting things out there in order to get better and better. You know, as well, your best today and what you're producing as, you know, great quality work, you might look back a few years from now and think, meh, that was okay. But it's all part of that process. So um, there's a, I can't remember the number of the episode, but you can find it on my website. I have a, an episode of the Clarity Podcast called Don't Be Afraid to Suck. And I do believe that, you know, suck yeah. being like, you know, I'm just kind of using that a bit tongue in cheek here, but like we have to be okay with not being perfect. And um, I forget what the other point was you made, but both good points, Jeff. Thank you. And, 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 like, I give you an example. You know, I spent ten years in the military. I was a military photographer, so I photographed a lot of high-powered people. You know, even even members of the royal family, and you know, entire ships, companies, thousands and thousands of people on on, on ships. You know, and so, so I went through that, and I did that, and that was my day-to-day -day job. And then I left the military, and what was my biggest nerve-wracking fear was the night before photographing my first wedding. Mm. After being a military, you know, I was absolutely terrified. I think I got about an hour's sleep. It was so daunting going out to photograph this little bride, you know, and I photographed members of the royal family and entire ships companies. But I had to start somewhere. I had to get out there, yeah. you know. And then, you know, years later, it be, the fear went. It dissipated completely, and I learned how to handle it, and I learned how to control the situation, and everything that could possibly go wrong on a wedding day has mm. probably gone wrong for me somewhere over the time 700 and odd weddings but you just deal with it, you know, yeah. um, you need to get yourself, you need, you need that push and you need to just go and do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I remember what I wanted to say about the other point you'd made and that is sort of, you know, the subjectivity, especially in a creative pursuit, like photography about, you know, what is good, what is perfect. And you, you know, you said it yourself. The fact is you might think you've done your best work ever and the client doesn't like it or they don't, you know, appreciate your perspective or they don't like the way the image was edited or whatever it may be. So I think when we remember that, you know, in many cases, perfect is only what we deem to be perfect, right? Like we're often the ones setting that bar and it may be set at a different place than someone else. That kind of hopefully can remove a bit of that pressure. Interestingly enough, Anne Thomas commented, you know, one of her fears was public speaking. And mm -hmm. Anne Thomas used to be a teacher before she was a yeah. photographer. So, so I find, you know, obviously standing up in front of people, you know, I, I would, you know, years ago, I would have found that terrible. Just standing yeah. up as a pupil in front of the classroom for me was was terrifying, you know. But yeah. now I do things like this, lives and, and, and webinars and public speaking. Yeah. Uh, and funny enough, Anne, if it makes you feel better, um, it's one of my biggest fears too, public speaking. It's one that I've in many ways moved through. I wouldn't say I've, you know, again, combated, but moved through over the last 18 to 24 months. But funny enough, I've developed a lot of comfort around public speaking online in this pandemic world. Um, I still have a lot of fear around public speaking in person. So, it, you know, it's a, a hurdle that I, I plan to to cross, though, because I know that it's going to allow me to build the kind of business that I want to be having. So and we'll, we'll talk about that, you know, the vision piece and how that plays all into all of this in just a moment. Okay, so some of our most commonplace fears, you know, what I see with my clients, what I see, you know, the work that I do with people having had conversations with hundreds of people, they are, you know, fear of irreparable damage. Okay, it's like this whole kind of notion, you know, maybe you had it Jeff with photographing weddings, it's like, I'm going to screw this up so bad, you know, none of the images are going to turn out, I'm going to lose the memory card, I'm going to ruin these people's relationship, they're going to, yeah. you know, get divorced, thanks to me, <laughs> whatever, like, it's, yeah. it's, this, it's this feeling that, things will go so poorly, the outcome will be so bad that there is no way we can ever recover from it. 
And the fact is, is that most things that happen in life, I, I always say the exceptions are death and children. Most things are recoverable from. That's not to say that, yes. you know, we can fix everything, but we are resilient. We can move beyond most things, you know, or, or move past most things that happen. Most things are not final. We can, you know, we get fired from our job. We get a new job. We have a bad relationship. Yeah, it's painful. It's hard, but we can have a, a new healthy relationship. So. All right, fear of failure is another big one, right? Like I'm just, I'm gonna suck, this isn't gonna work out, I'm gonna end up you know, homeless on the street, I'm gonna lose all my family's fortune, whatever it may be. Fear of what others think. You know, that sense of vulnerability, being judged by others. Fear of inadequacy, so not being able to measure up. And some people fear success. Um, I'm not one of those people, I'm, I'm here for it. <laughs> bring on the success. But with success, you know, that can be daunting for people based on let's say, um, you know, they grew up in a family where having a lot of money was equated with, uh, you know, being evil or selfish or whatever. It's like, they might fear having too much money and what that might mean. You know, success often means change in people's lives, being different, perhaps in your peers, the people that you're surrounded with. So actually, some people are fearful about success and what that means for them in their life. And I think, you know, a lot of stuff, a lot of these fears can, funny enough, you know, uh, fear number three and number uh, yeah. four there, you know, fear of what others think and fear of inadequacy. For me, you know, I still sometimes battle with that from, mm -hmm. and it is, is, is daft as it sounds, from the age of sort of like nine to 14 when I was bullied yeah. extremely at school and, and I, you know, I ended up leaving school because I just, I didn't fit in, I hated it. And, and I still carry that mentally, you know. Mm -hmm. It, and I'm 50 year old now, you know, so yeah. I still have that that worry about oh, what would people think, you know, that fear of inadequacy or, you know, I'm going to look stupid. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, so it, it doesn't have to just be to do with your, your current job. It can be an underlying thing that you've had mm -hmm. for, for years, you know. Yeah, I would agree with that. And, you know, although I'm not a, a, a therapist, a psychologist, you know, from everything I've heard and read, I think a lot of these experiences that we have of young children, you know, even up to and under the age of seven, that can have a huge, um, that can have a huge bearing on our lives. And, and one thing I would encourage people, you know, some, of, I do believe we can move through and work, work with this stuff, but sometimes it does really require professional support in the, in the, you know, form of a coach or a therapist, et cetera, in order to move back, um, move through these, these challenges and to really get at the root of what's there. Okay, I love this quote, one of my favorites. Um, Everything you want is on the other side of fear. And it's powerful for me because I actually, I see a very um, strong visual and that is I envision this kind of life that I want for myself. And, you know, we talked about it last week, like the qualities of the life we have, how we're gonna be spending our time. And in the middle between me and that life, I picture fear. It can be, you can picture, um, you can give it like real character. It could be, I don't know, some sort of monster. It could just be the word fear. It can be a color. But I think about everything that I want is on that other side of fear. And that really kind of gives me that motivation to know that I'm only going to get to those things by moving through fear, by having fear with me in the back seat of the car, maybe in the trunk tied up. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I've, I've to touch on something which is very yeah. simple, you know, that, that goes along these lines, and I've had this with so many photographers before, and um, you know, quite a few that, that I've worked with on a one-to-one -one basis is, you know, one of the biggest fears is that pricing fear. You know, what's people going to think when I send that quote out? And I've had a lot of photographers, and, and a few recently, um, you know, where I've says, just, just do it, just send that email for God's sake, just send it, and they've hit send, and then I've had a message, literally, you know, ten minutes later. An hour later, oh my God, Jeff, they've accepted the quote, mm -hmm. you know, and and I think once once they've you know you you bid on that particular price, it's maybe a lot higher than you're usually used to. It's an amount of money that you you you've never you've never sort of like asked for before, and then yeah. somebody accepts it the second time, it becomes easier. The third time, yeah. easier, and then you know six months down the line, you're putting your prices up again because you mm -hmm. realize you are worth more. Yeah. 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 I think confidence comes again through that action, just doing it in spite of the fear that you feel. And then the outcomes can be oftentimes very reaffirming. And, and I would encourage you as well, you know, if there's something that you're afraid of and you move through, you take an action, um, you know, as one of the viewers mentioned, like you take that small step, step, like 
pay attention to those wins that you have. You know, you okay, I had one client that said, said yes, like write it down, take note of it. I had another client that said yes, like kind of use those as, um, you know, feathers in your cap, so to speak, in terms of the fact that you you are capable, that your fears are not always going to be, usually aren't going to be founded. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to know, and you can think about this, or, you know, of course, put it in the comments as well. What resides on the other side of your fear? Is it greater earning potential? Is it more freedom and flexibility? Is it a particular project that you have your site set on? What's on the other side of your fear? All right, so I'm gonna share a few different tools and mindsets for moving beyond fear. And, you know, mindset does play a big role in this. Certainly, you know, the biggest thing we can do, the biggest antidote, antidote to fear, pardon me, is to take action. But I also believe, and you will talk about this when we talk about decision-making next week, the way that we view things, you know, the stories that we tell ourselves, our perspective on things, sort of having this, um, you know, reassuring self-talk, that can be really helpful as well. And we won't get into all of this today. It's work that I teach with my clients, both in my group as well as one-on-one. -on -one. But, you know, the way that we, we regard these things can be really helpful as well. It's not just about having like actual concrete tactics, but it's also how we choose to view things. Okay, so number one, um, look your fear in the face. Now, one thing I find interesting with fear is fear is often for me, sort of in the periphery. I don't know if anybody else can relate to this. So it's like, I know it's there. I can hear it in my ear. I can sort of see it, but I'm also wanting to oftentimes avoid it because it's scary to really think about all the terrible things that might come to pass. And so for this particular exercise, I want you to look fear in your face, in, in its face. I want you to go there. I want you to think about all the things that you're fearful of. And it's a little bit like, you may have heard this sort of suggestion if you're somebody who worries or has anxieties, Oftentimes, therapists will talk about setting aside time each day, dedicated time to, to worry. So in this case, we're going to look fear in its face. And this is how we're going to do it. First of all, I want you to explore your worst case scenario. So for example, um, Jeff, let's just use the example of your client with putting out a new, uh, you know, put together your new pricing for, for a project yeah. or for a quote. Mm -hmm. Okay, so worst case scenario, I want you to go really big. Like, I don't just want you to say, well, they're going to reject me. No, no, I want worst case scenario to be like the worst possible thing. So, you know, they're going to write back and say, you know, how dare you? This is obscene that you would ask for this much money, you, you greedy, you know, son of a gun. Um, you know, they're going to they're going to tell everybody in the industry not to hire you. Like, go really, really big. Go dark, okay? Next, what I want you to do is I want you to think about how you would handle this worst case scenario if it came to pass. So let's just imagine that the client writes back and says, you know, you greedy so-and-so, like, what would you do? Draft up the email response. What would you say to them? Let's imagine that they tell everybody in the industry not to hire you. Like, actually think about how you would handle that if it happened. Now, through this process, you're probably going to start to think, mm, actually, there's probably pretty slim chance that this is going to happen this way but at least is getting you thinking about the fact that you do have resilience. You do have tools in your tool belt in order to help you cope with this. You know, you're going to start to realize the likelihood of this is probably pretty slim. All right. Next, I want you to think about how you can prevent this from happening in the first place. So how you can sort of mitigate risk. So for example, you know, with the, the quote, quoting your price client uh, situation, you might say, I can mitigate risk with this if I'm only quoting people who I feel like are, have really bought into what I'm doing. Like they understand yeah. there's a good fit there. I'm not just gonna be throwing it out to anybody, somebody I've got trust with. You know, yeah. another way that you might mitigate risk is, um, I don't know, talking to some of your competitors in the industry to make sure you're not like totally out to lunch, for example, okay? So that way it's gonna be able to help you be a little bit prepared so you have some confidence going in to know that the likelihood of this is actually going to be pretty slim. Yeah, I mean, an example of that, you know, with the wedding side of things, one of the things we did very early on um, was to produce what was called a wedding shooting list. So on the day, you know, prior to the day, we would ask the bride exactly what is really important to her, what photographs must she have, who does she want family members in our pictures, and we'd have a full list of everything that was required by the bride on the day, other than the normal stuff, and then would make sure everything was done. So that was reducing the 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 the, the possibilities of our coming back mm -hmm. unhappy because we've we've given everything she expected and more. 
Totally. You've, you've really reduced the likelihood of that happening. You've probably also gotten things into place that if she was unhappy, you know, okay, this is the process that we would follow if somebody was unhappy with the work, for example, like yeah. just gives you a little bit of reassurance. Like I'm going to be able to deal with this. Doesn't mean it's going to be fun, but I'm ready for it. Okay. Number two over, let's talk about overcoming procrastination a little bit. And the first thing that I think a lot of people miss out with when they look at procrastination, both you know people who are trying to overcome pro procrastination as well as a lot of the advice around um, overcoming procrastination is people are like, right, this is how you're gonna overcome procrastination. I, I want you to stop first of all, and I want you to ask yourself, why are you procrastinating? Because depending why you're procrastinating is going to determine how you're gonna handle that. So if you you might find out I'm procrastinating because I actually really hate working with this client. You're going to handle that in a different way than you're procrastinating because you don't feel like you have the skill set in order to do the work versus you're procrastinating because you don't, you know, have the right resources available to you versus procrastinating because you name it. So figuring out why you're procrastinating is a good starting point. And sometimes the thing we're procrastinating on, we realize is actually something we don't want to do. Like if you're procrastinating over and over and over again, I'm gonna use the editing example we talked about last week, you know, a lot of photographers yeah. they maybe wanna do their own edits, but it's not work that they enjoy. If you constantly find yourself procrastinating on that, I'm gonna suggest you take a look at how you can do things differently. Okay, I mean, you, you, you can muscle through for the rest of your life, but at a certain point, if you're constantly procrastinating, for that matter, if you're just, you know, some people it's like, oh, I'm really procrastinating on, I don't know, starting this business or writing this book. I'm like, don't start the business or write the book. Like sometimes you don't yeah. want things enough and that's okay. You don't have to see your way through, but make a decision for yourself, okay? Were you gonna add something, Jeff? Yeah, I think that, that that's a really good point. You know, find out why you do it. And sometimes like you say, you know, if you're putting something off, it might be because you don't actually want to do it. Maybe it isn't a good fit. Maybe somebody has told you you should be doing this or you imagine you should be doing this because a lot of other photographers do it. Just because other people are doing it doesn't mean you have to do it. Yeah. Okay. So let's go with the assumption that like, yes, I want to do this. Okay. Game on. This needs to get done. Next, I want you to think about what your motivators are. And we don't need to just think about this for a specific task that you're procrastinating on. In general, I want you to think about what motivates you. And so, for example, some people are really motivated by accountability to others. In public accountability, i.e., you might tell you know, all of your social connections, hey, I'm going to be showing you the edits from the shoot I did last weekend tomorrow. Like, you're making yourself publicly accountable to say tomorrow yes. I'm going to show you the edits. That, that doesn't work for all people. Some people are like, I don't really care. <laughs> I'm just still not going to do it. I'm somebody, I'm big on public accountability. I'm a person of my word, you know, 99% of the time, of course, we all have our exceptions. So for me, when I put something out there, if I say, you know, Jeff, we're going to do this talk together these four weeks in August, I'm going to have to do the work to fulfill that because I'm somebody who wants to be accountable to someone else. Yeah. You mm -hmm. might be someone who is motivated by rewards. You might be somebody who you decide to, you know, treat yourself to something if you finish a big project. You might be somebody who, um, you know, wants to cook yourself your favorite cookies or, you know, go to a restaurant. Um, you know, I think I'm not saying we should dangle the carrot all the time, but sometimes it can help to say, hey, that's going to motivate me to get this thing done. Like if I finish these edits, which I've been dragging my feet on, um, I'm going to go have a glass of wine at my favorite wine bar tonight. I think that's probably okay. So think about what those motivators are in order to help you kick yourself into action. And Nick Neal uh, makes a good comment. She says, you know, the fear is the body producing uh, adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And she's learned to use the adrenaline as like an energy boost yeah. to uh, get a, a body in a state for readiness to, to, to go and do something. Totally. Yeah, they, they say that actually the way the body responds when you're afraid is very similar to way the way your body um, responds when you're excited. I know right now, like I feel a little, little clammy, a little sweaty here. Um, could I, I could say I'm afraid to be talking to you all right now, or I could say I'm excited. I choose to see it as excitement, right? I'm kind of yeah. keyed up. I'm in the moment. I'm in the flow. Those are positives for me, but I choose to think, see things that way. I could say, Oh God, I felt all nervous and clammy the whole time. <laughs> Yeah, okay. that's a fantastic way to look at it, isn't it? And, and don't think yeah. of it as, as fear as excitement. Yeah, cool. Yeah. 
Um, last point for that, set yourself up for success. Okay, so if you know that you have particular motivators, um, again, you know that being holding yourself accountable to someone else, you know, it might even be like saying to your partner, hey, I'm gonna like get this job done this weekend. It might be telling your client, like if you're like the only way, you might have a super easygoing client who's like, yeah, whatever, I need it whenever, but you just saying to them, I'll get it to you by Friday. If that's gonna help you, set yourself up for success. Like create both an environment and parameters and um, sort of the, the foundation for your work in a way that's going to help you and serve you. So, you know, even things like simple things, I, you know, I've got my phone here. Um, if I know that this is going to be a big tool for procrastination and I'm working on my edits, like do yourself a favor and put it in the drawer in the other room or turn it off. Set yourself up for success because you using your own willpower is going to be much more difficult than just not having to exercise that in the first place. Yeah. Um, great book about habits, by the way, is James, James Clear's Atomic Habits. He talks about that, you know, really setting up our environment accordingly. Okay, and then lastly, um, start small and then smaller still. So oftentimes we procrastinate because we're overwhelmed, because something just seems too big, because we don't know where to start. I've been doing some blog posts for my business recently, like pretty long form blogs, and it can be overwhelming. I'm like, how am I going to write a 2000 word blog post? Well, you know, I start really small. OK, let me just brain dump everything on this topic. Let me start pulling some of my resources together. Now, let me do a really crappy first draft. Now, let me start refining things. But if I just sat down and said, OK, I've got to write a 2000 word blog post, I'm probably going to procrastinate on it forever. So that, look at totally the right. smallest totally little right. granule. Sorry, go ahead. I, sort of, I totally agree. You know, it's just those little steps, isn't it? The small, uh, funny enough, I'm busy in the process with a new book at the moment. And I, I managed to find a, an app, an online app, because I was thinking about step counting and how every day, you know, I'm trying to get my 15,000 steps in to try and lose a bit of weight. And um, I, I thought, I wonder if there's um, a word count app that works <laughs> yeah. exactly sim similar as a, I step count out and sure enough I found it and I put in the the, the goal number of words for my next book, which is you know forty thousand, give myself a target and it actually sends it's exactly the same as the step counter. So when I've sat down at the end of the day, I'll put in my word count, it'll tell me whether I've reached it. It sends me um uh, alarms to uh, mm -hmm. to say, Come on, Jeff, you need to get right in, you know. So um yeah, it's brilliant. And I've got that little accountability to my to my app. Nice. Yeah. And for you, you're probably motivated by like seeing that number and hitting it. I know I'm somebody like that too. So if that's a motivator for you, yeah, look for tools that support you in that. Um, well, funny, another motivator is that, is I actually had my designer design the cover of the book ready. Nice. So I've seen what the book looks like, even though it's not fully written yet. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that ties into um, either point three or four, like which we'll talk about in a second, having that vision in mind, right? That's part of it for you. Having that cover that's helping you visualize and see this book as being done even before it's been written. Yeah. I'm sure you're starting to then think about it being out in the world when you actually see something concrete, like it is cover design. Um, another tip, uh, just tool that I like, um, I know some people you may or may not use or be familiar with the Pomodoro method, which is effectively working for a 25 minute sprint, taking a five minute break and then working again in a sprint. Um, that can be really helpful. You also recognize how, how quickly time goes by and how it can be tough to get things accomplished in those periods of time. But um, there's an app I like called Cuckoo, like, but C-U-C-K-O-O, -O, like Cuckoo Clock or Bird. Cuckoo dot, um, if you just, I think just put in Cuckoo and you'll find it, Cuckoo dot timer maybe. Anyways, it's uh, web-based, so it'll be in your browser tab. You can see how much time you have left and you can also use it with other people. So you could work virtually with somebody else sharing the same timer. And you can see, you know, you can do the kind of these work sprints and you get the little break and it gives a, an alert when it's done. It doesn't make a cuckoo bird sound, which is silly. <laughs> I don't know. It makes a different sound. <laughs> Anyways, I kind of like that app as well. So, Okay, a couple bonus tips for you for procrastination. Um, I've got a couple episodes on my podcast, The Clarity Podcast, which you can find at my website, which is down in the bottom corner, keltymaguire.com. Um, you can also find it on Spotify, Stitcher, and iTunes. And the, the two episodes are episode 21, um, which is my most recent episode called How to Start When You Can't Start. This is really about how do we get that momentum going when we feel like we can't even begin something. And then the other one is episode 14, um, which is called Six Ways to Tackle the Suck in Your Business. And that's basically about how do we tackle those sucky things that 
still have to get done? How can we make it a bit of fun? So um, suggest checking those two out if you need some more support with this. Fantastic, that's brilliant. All right, number three, get clear on your vision. So having, I mean, this is, it's kind of a funny and simple tip in a way because you might think, yeah, great, have a vision. Now I'm not gonna you know, be afraid anymore. But I have to say personally for me, the way that I've done things that have scared me in my life is by becoming clear on and remaining affixed to the vision that I have for what resides on the other side of fear, as George Adair said. So first step for this, if you didn't already, check out last week's session um, with Jeff, which is creating your photography business vision. Uh, you can find it under the hashtag here in the group or on Facebook, you have it under the lessons. Is that right? That's right, yeah, in the okay. uh, private Facebook group. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and in there I share a few different mm -hmm. questions you can ask yourself and how you can start thinking about your and crafting your own vision for your business. Next. I really encourage you to regularly create time and space to focus in on this vision, whether that's sitting down with your journal once a week to just think about, you know, specifically how this is going to look, how this is going to feel, you know, thinking about where you're going to be in six months, 12 months, et cetera. It can be goal setting, but I don't think we should be so future oriented that we forget to enjoy ourselves in the present, but it's also really helpful to have something sort of that North star that compass, as we talked about last week, in order to keep ourselves on track when things are challenging. I mentioned that I was afraid or still sometimes I'm fearful of public speaking. And I had the first opportunity to do a bigger talk um, with Creative Mornings, which is a large networking organization a couple of years ago now. And as much as part of me wanted to say no when this opportunity came my way, the vision I had for myself and my business and connecting with other business owners and entrepreneurs, um, creatives here, this was in the Munich space here in, here in the city. That was something that allowed me to move past that fear because I knew that this talk would help me get closer towards that vision that I had. Mm. And allow this vision that you have to be your driver and the thing that resides beyond your fears and to really remind yourself of that and ask yourself, you know, if you feel afraid to do something. Let's say Jeff had said, hey, let's team up for this thing. And I thought, oh, you know, crap, like Jeff's got like 25,000 followers and this is gonna be really scary and I don't know anything about photography. I could have allowed that to determine like that I'm not gonna do this thing. I might've just said, no, sorry, Jeff, thanks. This, this isn't for me. But for me to have this vision of, okay, cool. I'm gonna get in front of like new potential clients. I'm gonna be able to share my message with people. I'm gonna um, be able to rub shoulders with a you know LinkedIn expert and all these things. Those things could then be my driver and help me to move beyond the fears that I had. Fortunately, it didn't scare me too much, Jeff. So <laughs> it was an easy yes. Okay, lastly, number four, this is about perfectionism. Um, so I just wrote this blog post, which I know I shared with a couple of you already because you'd mentioned perfectionism, something you struggle with. Um, it's called Survival Guide for Perfectionists. Um, and the blog post is, has eight ways to overcome perfectionism. Um, it's one of these really long form posts that I wrote, talks about you know where perfectionism stems from, how perfectionism is damaging to ourselves and our businesses, and then eight ways for you to overcome perfectionism. Um, again, that's on my website, keltymcguire.com. I can also share that inside the Facebook group um, and I'll try and share it on the comments in LinkedIn. It's something's a little bit tricky to leave things in the right order on these lives, but I'll share the link with you right. on there. Um, and then I'm just gonna share a couple of those eight ways with you or a couple tips from the eight ways with you right now. So the first thing is to set a limit for yourself. So if you are a perfectionist, if you identify with perfectionist tendencies, and I'm gonna guess that probably maybe not all, but many or most of you are, just because I think it tends to go hand in hand with people who are very um, you know, creative, aesthetically driven, they perform at that high level, which I know you all do. Set a limit for yourself. And what set a limit for yourself means, it can show up in different ways. So a limit might be that if you are one of those people who's like gets so obsessed with your editing that you spend two hours on a photo, as Jeff talked about at the beginning of these sessions, you might say that my limit is no more than 15 minutes per image. Yeah, I have no idea how long these things should take. It probably depends yeah. on the project and all that. Settle so that might be a limit. It could be a time limit. You know, you might have a limit of, um, you know, if I want to approach some new brands to partner with, like my limit is I need to reach out to ten companies by Friday. Okay, so by setting sort of parameters for yourself in which to do things, that can help you move into action and help push this perfectionism aside. 
It can also be, you know, we talked about having that accountability to other people can sometimes help you as well to move through perfectionism. So I give a few more suggestions around what I mean by setting a limit and how this might work, but that can be a good way to start. Second of all, I want you to look for examples of imperfect success. And I'm sure that you know of them because they're probably other people in the industry who drive you crazy because you can see that their work just isn't perfect and how did they manage to land that gig and how come they're making so much money and how come they're in the latest publication? This is good. We want to see imperfect success, imperfect success out there. You know, as Jeff talked about, oftentimes we're gonna be so much more critical than our clients are, so much more critical than perhaps I'm guessing with photography, there's a lot of probably subpar content out there because everybody, including me as a photographer, let that be a reminder that it doesn't need to be perfect in order to have an impact, in order to be liked by people, in order to make money. And kind of have that as a reminder when you find yourself obsessing over perfection. I mean, I'll give you a, a quick example of that. Is one of the things when I very, you know, when I first started my photography business in 2004 after leaving the military, I did a, a marketing course with a, a photography mentor called Charles Lewis. Uh, American photography mentor and one of his big things was you know to make yourself stand out there is to offer a guarantee so mm -hmm. that you you know you, you say I offer 100% guarantee money back guarantee satisfaction guaranteed to really connect with your clients so we started doing that that was really really frightening because nobody did it as wedding photographers yeah. nobody says you know you love your photographs or your wedding your wedding money back you know you 750 weddings I've done 750 weddings plus actually in my in my career and I've only ever had one person ask for a refund and then it turned out they were trying to scam us anyway. Yes, <laughs> we did, yes, I did have a few complaints, but there were minor complaints. They were like, oh, you never got a picture of my auntie from, from London or yeah. we would have preferred if you got more stuff. You know, so, so things like that was easily rectified, you know, oh, we'll give you a free 20 by 16 print or something like that, something to keep them happy. Um, but the worst case scenario never happened. We never had anybody demanding a refund, yeah. you know, and, 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 and that was from day one. And remember that you know, I'm not the best wedding photographer in the world. I've been photographing <laughs> ships and people in military uniform prior to that. I just, I did it. I put it out there. Yeah. I went for it. And then I just dealt with it one wedding at a time. Yeah. But you were imperfectly successful, right? There we go. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so there's many yeah. wedding photographers who'd like to photograph that many weddings and, and you did it. So, and, and clients didn't complain, they were happy. So, okay, great example. Okay, so I'd love for you now to just share one takeaway in the comments from today's session, either something that resonated with you, something that's perhaps shifted in terms of your perspective on all of this. Uh, maybe it's an exercise that you're gonna try. Maybe you're gonna go through that fear exercise with the worst case scenarios, but um, it would be really helpful to both Jeff and I if you would just share something that you're gonna take away from today's session in the comments. And uh, Raymond Jones, and uh, backed up by uh, Simon Moore as well, you know, Raymond said that, um, he puts things off because he's introverted and he finds it crippling using the telephone, uh, networking, that sort of stuff. Now, first of all, I would say, well, you know, I am, I am quite an introverted person. Nothing um, puts me off more than walking into a room full of people, uh, having loads of fun, enjoying themselves in a sort of party atmosphere, that sort of thing. You know, give me a, a meal for two or three friends. Um, in a quieter scenario than somewhere where you know everything's busy and people are and the same with networking as well when i first did uh, business networking business breakfast clubs and you had to do that first stand up and intru introduce yourself for 60 seconds mm. i was sweating i could feel a sweat running down the back of my shirt every every thursday morning but i still kept going along i still kept doing it and the, the, the chances are, you know, that the other people in the room are exactly the same, aren't they? You know, and, and, yeah. and I hear of so many other people who you think, what, you you feel like that? But I always thought you were like invincible. I always <laughs> thought you wouldn't be scared of anything. You know, and to hear, funny enough, the other week I was talking about something and my, my kickboxing coach, who's a world champion kickboxer, British champion kickboxer as well. You know, he's a tough guy. Um, and he was telling me about something he was frightened of. And I was like, what you were frightened of that? <laughs> I didn't think you were frightened of anything, you know? I can't. Uh, and, and it just goes to show that, you know, um, everybody, everybody, yeah. everybody has some sort of fear, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, 100%. I, I remember I had a, a former sales manager when I was in sales, and he said to me, you know, I was talking to my wife the other night, and I said, Kelty, she's the most fearless person I know. And I was like, sorry, me? 
what? I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm a very anxious person. I certainly have a lot of fears. You know, I always found it nerve wracking picking up the phone and going to client calls and making pitches. But I think the difference is really people who decide to do things in spite of fear. That said, and I would agree, you know, I think we kind of build a bit more comfort or immunity to these situations that stress us out. Um, for the gentleman who shared, you know, he's introverted, he finds that hard. I would also encourage you to look at how you can also do things on your terms. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, when I was in sales, I had a colleague who said, oh, you know, I don't pick up the phone. I just email all my clients. Now, I personally, I do well, you know, chatting with people kind of face to face, voice to voice. But for her, email worked really well. She was also very introverted. She didn't feel comfortable picking up the phone and she was very successful. So I would say, you know, for you, maybe large networking events don't work as well for you. But that doesn't mean that you can't reach out, you know, to someone one to one and have a coffee exchange with them on Zoom. Or that doesn't mean that, you know, maybe you don't really like corresponding with your clients over the phone. But I think there are ways we can meet in the middle if there's something that we have a greater degree of comfort with. And I think seeking out people who operate in those ways, it can be helpful. So, And, and, and something both both uh, you and, and I do a lot on LinkedIn is use that voice clip yeah. um, option, you know, and obviously if you, you, you can leave a 60 second voice clip. It really makes a big difference. The amount of people who people they will message it. me and then I'll leave a, a personalized voice clip back and they'll be like, oh my God, Jeff, thanks for taking the time <laughs> to do that. You know, so okay. instantly it's broke down any barriers between somebody. Um, yeah. And if you, if you make a mess of it, you can just remove it straight away. Okay. You, know? yeah. you can yeah. delete it. So Yeah, yeah, good suggestion. Okay, so if you would like my one-on-one -on -one support addressing the fears that are holding you back, um, in addition to everything that I shared today, I do wanna let you all know that I offer free 30-minute clarity sessions through my website. Um, you know, not an infinite number, you can't book one every week, um, but the two of us will sit down virtually. Um, we're gonna talk about the things that are holding you back in your business, how you can get clear in terms of what it is you want, um, and you'll leave that session having that next first step in terms of how you can move towards the vision that you have for yourself. So um, don't hesitate to do that. If you're interested to you know, chat further about how I can support you or to get my initial support, you can book that on my website. Again, keltymaguire.com. Okay, is, that's so fantastic. So you, yeah. you, you know, Raymond, why not why not reach out to Kelty and uh, I know it's a phone call or it might be a Zoom, but um, <laughs> she already knows your fears anyway. So you know that that might be a good thing to just um, yeah, say right, okay, I'm going to put myself out and I'm going to I'm going to speak to Kelty because I've already effectively spoken to her mm -hmm. um, during the live and uh, and and then hopefully she might be able to give you some really good tips to to get over this and, and help me with you know pushing forward with your business definitely yeah i'd be happy to okay so next week we're going to talk about making aligned decisions uh, decision making is one of my favorite near and dear topics it's help something i help a lot of people with and of course we're all making decisions day to day you know which opportunities do i say yes to yes or no to what direction do i take things how much do i charge all of these things, of course, involve choice making, decision making. Uh, so next week, we're going to talk about how we can do that more effectively. So Brilliant. I'm just going to stop screen sharing there. And we can see if there are any questions we want to wrap things up. There we go. I think we've got most of them cool. covered there. Uh, and, and, you know, if anybody, funny enough, you're talking about accountability and stuff like that before and, you know, put yourself out there saying, I'm going to get this done. Um, I think uh, actually Jonah did a, did a post today uh, and tagged me in it on LinkedIn and said, you know, I've got to get my LinkedIn uh, SSI score up. Um, thanks to Jeff Brown, the photographer's mentor, for for, for mentioning it. So, you know, uh, and I've just told him um, in a post, you know, get more posting done, get more content uh, um, produced. So Jonah is is now accountable to me and he's going to be sharing his his LinkedIn SSI score in a few weeks' time. But if anybody else wants to do that, if you, you're worried about something, drop me a message, or if you want to tag me in a post and you want a bit of accountability, then fine, that, that's what I'm here for. You know, I'm, I'm here to help. I don't mind doing that myself. Yeah, good suggestion. Yeah, there's, I think, you know, most of us hopefully have, and certainly in the community, peers, friends, family, et cetera, that are willing to check in, to make that phone call, um, to follow up with us. So take advantage of it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. It was another great session, a little bit longer than last week. So thanks, everyone, for your time and attention. Hopefully you found this valuable. And thank you, Jeff, for hosting me again. Brilliant. And thanks again, guys. And, and uh, 
Look forward to seeing you next week. And obviously, if you, you haven't caught all of this, just go back to the hashtag creating successful photographers. You can see it down at the bottom there. And then you can rewatch this. It'll probably take about five minutes to, to load up to the, the platform. And then you can rewatch this as often as you want. So thanks again, guys. And look forward to seeing you again next Tuesday. And thanks again, Kelty. It's been absolutely amazing. Awesome. Bye. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Bye now.